All right, guys, welcome back to Transmit the 1075. This is gonna be part two of electric vehicles in the fire service. Uh, please watch part one. I filmed it actually three years ago, and I think it held up pretty well, actually. I had it on a different channel, so this is the first time guys on the, at the fire service are seeing this, uh, seeing part one, but I think it held up pretty well. And I'm happy to say that one of the points I made too is for American firefighters, if you didn't make it look like a fire truck, it was never gonna succeed. So hey, at least Pierce already has listened to me on that one. This looks like a fire truck. You wouldn't know it otherwise. And so that's a good first start. Um, before I get into all the details, we're gonna go through their website. We're gonna go through some YouTube videos. We're gonna dig through the whole rig and I'm gonna give you my honest opinion. I'm not, look, if you've listened to the first video, you'll know that I was a career firefighter. Um, I'm also an owner of a, a, a renewable energy company. I've actually done, not only did I do solar projects, but we do um, EV charging stations, including I did the first school bus charging station, the first one in the entire uh, state of New Jersey. Uh, but, but I'm not gonna sugarcoat things. If I think it's not gonna work, and there's some things that I see that don't work, I will tell you. And on the same token, if uh, there's are guys that are stuck in political nonsense of uh, what their certain party is telling them is, is the reality of things, I'm gonna point that out as well. And so let's actually start there. Let's talk politics first. And it's pathetic that we have to do this, but it's, it's the world that we're living in. So I will put my cards on the table here right now and tell you that I've lived most of my life uh, as a center left um, uh, person. Although I have to say over the last couple of years, I've become uh, a person without a party uh, because I think they both suck at this point. And I think if we don't get money out of politics and stop the tribalism, uh, things are never gonna change and never gonna get better. Uh, but let's, let's talk about the political um, things about, about the, the politics around climate change. In short, if you think your tribe knows everything, you're wrong. If you don't think that Democrats have valid points, you're wrong. If you don't think Republicans have valid points, you're wrong. Um, is there too much plastic in the oceans? Yes. Are we overfishing the oceans? Yes. Um, is it getting warmer for reasons either man-made or possibly over long periods of time of which we maybe can't all figure it out and maybe we should listen to each other? Yes. But at the end of the day, there are many good reasons to switch to electric fire trucks. And so let's just look at it, forget climate change, forget politics, let's just look at this. I wanna look at this is, is this a better technology? Okay, that's the only thing I'm gonna be talking about for the most part, other than dabbling on this political BS for a bit, is, is this technology better? And so, so you understand, Ener electricity, okay, isn't a resource. It's a form of energy, okay? We can't dig electricity out of the ground. But this vehicle can run on electricity. So if you're in California and there's um, solar power, you can run it on solar. If your part of the country has wave energy, hydro, uh, you can run it on that. If you're in West Virginia, you can run it on coal. If you're in a uh, area that has nuclear power, you could run it on nuclear. And let's just dabble on that as one more portion of the political uh, discussion. If anyone, I will tell this to my Republican friends and my Democratic friends who scream and yell every day that we have to do everything we can about climate change. If any liberal and any politician, Democratic politician, gave a shit about climate change, we would be building nuclear power plants tomorrow all over the country. Uh, this isn't your grandfather's nuclear power, okay? We can build nuclear power that, that uses spent fuel cells that we have rotting away in areas of the country. We can use those few cells that can't be, those cells can't be used as um, nuclear for, for nuclear weapons. Um, we can make these, the vessels that they do this stuff in, uh, where they don't need generators to, uh, like at Fukushima and other places that they, they I, there's some type of, I don't, please forgive me, but some kind of liquid metal vessel that can withstand heat if the power goes out and so that they don't, um, uh, you don't have the issues of needing generation, uh, generators to, to cool them, diesel generators. 
Anyway, my point is, if we were really concerned about this, these things, we could be doing this. But for now, I want everyone up to open up their minds and just look at this for what it is. It's a fire truck that happens to run electricity and we can power it in any way imaginable. And I would argue, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you're on, if we can run, on, run it on American electricity, right? Let's just say it's coal. Let's just say it's wind. Let's just say it's solar. Whatever it is, we can make that and we have that in the United States and we're not dependent upon other countries who don't like us and we're not dependent upon going to war to defend these resources. Okay, that's my soapbox argument for on politics. Let's get into why, why or why not uh, electric fire trucks are ready for the big leagues. All right, I knew I'd forget a thing or two. So battery technology or batteries. Oh my goodness, the batteries. So without question, I will concede this point on the front end as well. Is battery technology perfect? Are there people in, in India or Africa or whatever sourcing these minerals and these things and, and it's unfair and, and people are being harmed? Yes. Uh, are some of these resources of limited uh, quantities and they would be problematic or in countries that we don't like? Yes. Um, is the perfect situation? No. Is disposing of these batteries and things at times potentially a problem? Yes. Okay. So that isn't to say that fossil fuels don't come with their own laundry list of problems. And so to argue one way or the other to say that we can't use batteries because they have problems is ignoring the, the, the issues that fossil fuels have themselves. So there is a balance. We can always do better. We can always improve technology. We always, we always can change technology. And in, when a technology is in its infancy, okay, um, there's an understanding that we're, we have to start somewhere and we're going to work towards a better outcome. Uh, like when, if you have a gasoline car, you're, uh, you're, you're converting less than a third, uh, often maybe only 25% of the energy in the gasoline is converted into motion. The rest is turned into waste heat. All right, so let's get started. Here we are on the Pierce website. I must concede I've been a Seagrave man my whole life, but you know what? Uh, Pierce always made a really high quality piece of equipment. Let's see what they've got here. All right, so let's just initially kick through their video and see what and get a vibe for what's going on. A new era is By the way, that's an electric siren. They had a cue on the front bumper and then they played the cue version of a siren on the uh, from the electric siren. That that's a, a faux pas right from the beginning. The future of fire apparatus is electric. Fire departments are seeking environmentally conscious fire apparatus that reduce emissions, minimize fuel consumption, and produce less noise. The solution is here. A revolutionary fire apparatus from Pierce that matches the ambitions of your department and city. A zero emissions and zero compromise apparatus. Introducing the first electric fire truck in service in North America. The Pierce Volterra Pumper. Game-changing innovative technology allows the Pierce Volterra Pumper to utilize electric power without compromising on the leading edge operational performance, functionality, safety attributes, customization, and traditional configurations you expect from Pierce and it's designed to look like a fire truck because that's what it is. The Pierce Volterra pumper runs quietly, but make no mistake, its performance is like no other. Whether it's an EMS call or needing full fire suppression capabilities, the Pierce Volterra pumper shows up to the scene ready to perform. The Pierce Volterra pumper features a patented parallel electric drivetrain which allows zero emissions operation when powered by the integrated onboard batteries and is coupled to an internal combustion engine to provide seamless uninterrupted power to the pumping system or drivetrain when needed. 
the revolutionary Pierce Volterra platform of electric vehicles reduces emissions, supports lowering total cost of ownership, and increases your performance as a first responder. And when performance matters, fire departments trust Pierce to perform like no other. All right, so that's the um, first video. And look, I like everything they had to say. They're saying it's zero emissions. They're saying it's zero compromise, uh, reduced noise. Uh, okay, let's let's see. Let's actually listen to this uh, chief here. But so far, okay. Let's, so my name is Scott. We're not going to take them the for their word, but let's see what he has to say. Madison Fire Department. Uh, I've been blessed to serve the city of Madison here. I actually grew up in the city of Madison. I was born and raised here, but I've been blessed to uh, serve the community here since 1997 in the fire department. So the city of Madison, just like many other cities throughout the country, is really trying to figure out ways to improve on um, emissions. I think that's our focus, is not only like the health and wellness of our people, but the health and wellness of our community that we serve. So I'm gonna start stopping here and there. Like, look, I'm completely for uh, reducing admission uh, uh, emissions um, and obviously you want to truck the rig that's you know energy efficient and all but at the end of the day I'm a firefighter that's not my priority my priority is does it work can I do the job can I save lives um, and does it do the job as good or better than a diesel powered and for generations and generations to come Health and wellness is a big thing that we talk about in the fire service, um, mostly so for our members. And this is another, this is a big, um, you know, a big improvement from where the diesel fuel. Um, I remember when I started back in 1997, we used to have to wash the walls of the fire station. Talk about. Did, I, we didn't wash the walls, but I know exactly what he's talking about. Yes, you go to any firehouse in the country that doesn't have a prime event system, you can take your finger. I mean, after a couple of years, the walls are, 10 shades darker. Um, so you can only imagine what that's doing to your lungs. Technology game changing. Um, there will be no more wall washing in the city of Madison with technology like this. So things have come a long way with climb events and other types of things to try to improve the health and wellness of our firefighters. But we still have a long ways to go in the fire service. And this is just another big tool, um, an expensive tool, but a tool that uh, nonetheless, that is really gonna make it better and safer for our men and women. So let's dabble on that. He's saying expensive. So. My hope is too here, guys. That like, look, I, I think this the price of this thing is a one point something, I, one half a million, one and a half. I should, I should, I apologize for not knowing that, but they're significantly more expensive than a regular fire engine. But I also think that's because uh, the economy scale is just not there yet, right? If they're only building ten of these things or twenty of these things or working out the kinks. Uh, when you're building thousands of them um, and you have a, a supply chain is when you're when you're saving money so no one should be um should yell and scream about the price just yet because you can't expect the first vehicle to ever be designed or the fifth one down the down the line to be as cheap as something that's being built for the last 50 years our service our partnership with Pierce really goes back decades. They're obviously right up the road. They're only a couple hours away. Um, not only are we get a, a chance to, to still talk and, and deal with our salespeople at Reliant, but we get to meet the engineers. Our people have direct line of communication right with the engineers. So it doesn't always need to flow through me, uh, which is awesome. Pierce has learned a lot um, because of this experience of our men and women here at Station 8 driving this truck. And um, for that, I'm really grateful that we had the opportunity to do it because we've learned a lot as well. Presenting a product when we know it's not quite finalized yet before it goes out to sale, I think is, is really uh, super beneficial. And this truck is... Right. So look, these guys are in Wisconsin. Uh, Pierce is built in Wisconsin. Wouldn't surprise me if they gave them a special deal or brought the thing in for free, or, but God knows what has happened. Uh, but anyway, check out that video when you have the chance and it's in, in the full extent. But let's start getting into it. And I'm going to start digging into the things that I have seen. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is like I'm on my fourth or fifth electric car. Um, like I said, I've done tons of um, EV charging stations. And I'm familiar with the technology, particularly through Tesla and even with their semi or the Cybertruck or all the vehicles that they have. And so there's a couple things in my mind that I'm wondering about that don't make sense to me. Now, I will say again, I can I can see that this is their first round. They're even suggesting that this is sort of like they're uh, going through the uh, 
learning curve of, of what to do here. But there's one particular thing I want to bring up here that I, I don't understand. I wish I had an, I could speak to one of their engineers, but I, I don't like the design um, aspect of this. And so it's a couple things, actually. So let's start off with the first thing, the battery. I don't know why they've placed the battery in this uh, location. All the electric vehicles I've ever been, any electric vehicle that's been built from the ground up always has the battery on the bottom of the rig. And this is done for a whole host of reasons. Uh, one, you know, they mentioned that the center of gravity is, on this is still good, but I'm sure it's maybe it's fine. But the fact that it's up this high above the wheels uh, wouldn't be nearly as good if it was laying down here. I don't know, laying here or laying under the guy under the feet of the uh, of the uh, chassis. Regardless, I don't know why it's there. It that doesn't make sense to me. It should be down low and um, out of the way. You know, it, I would think here too that this is, I don't know what the ultimate distance is here where this ba battery is being fit, but I think this is probably a couple feet. So obviously that's extending the rig further out. And so if it was on a lower section, it would be, um, it would make the rig shorter, easier turning races, turning radius and so forth. Uh, but here's the other big thing here. So, um, I started digging into this, uh, the information about the rig when I was going to do this presentation. And so look, what is this? The reason why they have, uh, th uh, they have this is because anytime you put a battery in any vehicle, you're concerned about range. And if the range isn't adequate, one way to get around that is to have an ICE an, uh, uh, internal combustion engine. And this is what they're doing. So they have an engine here. So in my view, unfortunately, I feel we've defeated the entire purpose of the thing. So I'm, I'm all in on electric vehicle, okay? Build me an electric fire truck with batteries and it runs on batteries, you can do everything. Um, that makes environmental sense to me. But if I, I have batteries, which as I mentioned, you know, take resources and take uh, and have their own demons, if I then have to have an engine that runs on, I'm assuming here's diesel, um, it has its own demons. Well, now I have two problems instead of just one. Um, we need to get to a point where we've eliminated the engine. Okay, if we're gonna go battery, I don't wanna see an engine here, okay? I wanna get rid of fossil fuels altogether. And I also don't wanna have, you know, one of the things I like about electric vehicles is that the the you know they discuss the maintenance goes down significantly. Well, if I have a diesel engine, I still need to do oil changes. They may be at a at a lower rate, but I still have to check the oil. Right, I, I'm still I'm still dealing with these things. Another thing I find unusual about this setup, which is very different than my experience with Tesla, uh, all the vehicles, and particularly the semi is that Tesla puts electric motors on the wheels. So let's, this is, this is not what you're seeing here, but they have their battery and then there's, um, this is the pump. Here's the, the electric motor is here with a drive shaft. Tesla vehicles have the motors on the wheels. So it eliminates a drive shaft and it puts the power directly at the source. And so you're, you're, you're not dealing with some of the components here, right? The other thing I advocated in the first video, if you haven't seen it, is that with, batter, with electric vehicles compared to combustion engine, you're usually reducing the parts by two thirds. Well, here, are, are we actually increasing the parts? Because now I have two um, drive trains or two uh, energy sources. So I'm not... I'm not digging this, I have to be completely honest. And maybe to Pierce's uh, defense, this may be your first generation where they're just figuring this stuff out and, and, and getting a better understanding of what's going on. But to me, you have the battery low, you have the motors on each side, and then the battery powers the motors, period, end of story. Now, in the short term, I, I have some experience of this because I know of some other electric vehicles. In other vehicles, I'll give you an example. It's a vastly smaller vehicle, but uh, BMW i3, I own one of them. They also had range anxiety problems and they also had a battery that couldn't go as far as they, they would want you to go. 
And what did they do about that? Uh, in their case, they put in a very small uh, gasoline engine, uh, but the gasoline engine made electricity. So as opposed to having this big engine that's also driving the drive shaft, just run a generator that is then pushing electricity back into the battery and charging it. And so what can happen is, as the battery is being depleted, maybe they have some, again, I don't know where you would set this level, but when the battery is half empty, this generator starts running and it's feeding electricity back to the battery. And then the battery then always runs the drives the wheels. And what's vastly better about this, and is my as far as my understanding, is that if I run this engine down the road, it's going at higher level RPM and lower uh, RPM, and so it's less efficient. But if I'm just running a generator, I can run that generator at an even keel speed all the time. It's more efficient, and I'm making electricity. And again, I'm just driving the vehicle. All right, so that's let's keep going here. Apparently, the station eight, which is where this engine is, uh, responds to about two hundred uh, has responded to about two hundred calls. So okay, I mean that's that's I, I don't know what they do in a year, but you know they're I think this is in a short period of time. So whatever the rig's going out the door on a semi regular basis. Um, it says it he drives one hundred percent. It drives 100% like a traditional pumper. It has a lot of electric torque and, and our drivers love how it handles and how quiet it is. Um, as an electric car owner, I don't dispute any of that whatsoever. However, I'd like to know what they ultimately mean. Um, it does drive like a traditional pumper, but ultimately what I wanna know is how often is this thing operating like an electric fire truck? And so, here was the first time I came across some real information, and this is assuming that this information is accurate. But it says, "Pardon me." It says the it says the um, the rig is powered by a 155 kWh battery pack. Uh, so to give you some perspective, um, when Tesla Model S came out, I think it was in in 40 something range. But generally speaking, they came out with a 60 kW. H battery pack it went to 75 went to 90 then to 100 so right now you walk into a um a tesla dealer to buy one of their expensive sedans and you're gonna buy a battery pack that's 150 uh excuse me 100 uh kwh okay so geez this this um no wonder it has this backup engine uh, diesel powered engine, I believe, um, you know, it's only 55 kWh uh, bigger battery pack than, than, my, than, than my car, or actually mine's a 60, but then, then the largest uh, Model S sedan. So that's um, disconcerting. Um, again, you have the, the, you have the diesel engine. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But you know, why aren't we going full out here? Um, to give you some perspective, um, the the Tesla semi-truck, right? The 18-wheeler, it's very aerodynamically designed. They're saying it's gonna go about 500 miles. Now, you know, my goodness, a, the fire engine can go 500 miles. That ends and, and solves every problem that you could possibly imagine, and I'll discuss that, but, um, I'm not suggesting it has to be that big, but the 18 wheeler, that's a lot heavier. You know, I don't know what, how much an 18 wheeler weighs, but it's probably more than 40,000 pounds. Uh, I know it's more than 40,000 pounds. Um, they have an 850 kW. We're dealing with a 155 and a, you know, a car driving down the road from Tesla is 100. So it's, it's grossly underpowered um, as far as being able to operate all by itself. Um, they have a 150, a 1500 gallon per minute pump, you know, whatever. Okay. That's probably fine for a city department. That's pretty, you know, I think nowadays you'll see a lot of two thousands, but whatever, that doesn't phase me. It's 4,200 pounds that the gallon, uh, uh, size on the tank is 500 gallons, which is pump completely fine again for a city engine. But once again, if we're starting to think about whether this can be used in any area of the country, 
Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that they just went with 500 gallons. You start talking 1,000, 1,500, you're adding a tremendous amount of weight, which is going to make the rig uh, go even a shorter distance. And so let me dig in here and find out. So at the, at the end of the day, right, so it's, we're saying it's a 500 gallon tank, uh, 1,500 gallons per minute, um, 155 kWh battery, but how far does this thing go in a battery? And here's the answer. It says here for the for 24 hours use, we get about 37 miles uh, of range before having to recharge. Um, I have to concede uh, it's vastly less than what I was hoping for. Um, can you fake it in the city potentially? Yes. Okay. So it's once again. The, the area that they chose, I think I saw here somewhere, we can probably dig it out. I think they said their average or their whole, their, um, uh, the section of the city that they cover, I think at worst case is two miles out and two miles back. So you're talking about a four mile um, uh, complete drive. But as I said in the first video I made in the city, coming back, charging all the time, but what you want to do with an electric vehicle, and this is known in the industry, not just me, but you obviously have to plan, especially with a fire truck, it, it, it can't just work 95% of the time or 98% of the time. We need this thing to be ready to go 100% of the time. And of course, with the backup diesel engine, it will do that. But my, I would just advocate, you know, geez, if we could get, if, if we could, the technology exists, right? We know that Tesla can do 500 miles, okay? If you could get 200, 300 miles uh, without doing you know, math on the back of a napkin, I can tell you right now that would solve the problem on any fire truck in the nation, okay? And if you, have, if, if you had that much range, then the charging levels, okay? We're gonna talk about this a little further. Or we're gonna talk about it next is a lot of these firehouses have these, they're built into this firehouse, these, these high level charging stations. And which is fine, but these, these charging stations are very, very expensive. So to give you some background, there's essentially three uh, levels of charging, one, two, and three. Level one is like 110 volt, which is you know out of your outlet, plug it into a standard uh, 15 or 20 amp outlet. You plug in any, big size a car or, or a, forget a fire truck a tesla is going to take you 18 hours to charge that way so that's not really doable um 240 volt level two very doable at 30 amps 40 amps 50 amps i think you could even go to 100 amps nowadays on a level two you could knock out some power and i think if you had a big enough battery you put a 200 mile fire truck uh in the firehouse you could back, you could recharge that with with uh, a level two charger. And level two chargers, like I said, are 50 amps, 30 amps, up to 100. Um, they're not expensive, reasonably speaking, and almost any firehouse can handle that power upgrade. You start talking about these high level DC voltage charging um, stations, these level three that are doing, you know, for, to give you some perspective, Tesla is talking about, you know, they can do 300 or 400 or 500 amps at um, at four, whatever it is, 400 something volts. You're talking about a, a shit ton of power, but extremely expensive and also highly probable. Many firehouses don't have the electrical capacity in the building to even ponder that idea. So anyway, so. I hate to be the bearer of bad news here or poo-poo their first round of, of a fire truck, but I don't see this fire truck being that different than the original uh, fire truck that we were seeing uh, from the first video I did. Um, it looks better, it's designed pretty nice, it's from a great manufacturer, and it will certainly work with that engine, uh, with the diesel engine uh, with it, but again, you know, at the end of the day, as as they alluded to, we're trying to make a world the world a better place and have less emissions and less costs and and be sustainable. Uh, having to have two different types of power systems on a fire truck, in my view, isn't accomplishing that goal. It, it may be what we have to do as our first step, but it is what it is, I suppose.
One thing I hear mentioned a lot in the comments is, you know, you get to a fire and people are going to die because you, the, the rig dies or whatever else. And so not that that's not theoretically possible, but what I want people to understand is when you're talking about batteries on, on a fire engine, the, the consumption of energy is really mostly about getting the vehicle there. Okay. And it's another reason why they, I think, use this Wisconsin firehouse that only has a two mile district is that if you're staying at 35, 40 miles an hour, top speed, maybe 50, the slower speed you go, uh, uh, use vastly less um, energy. So, but driving the, an, a, a vehicle down the road is what was what most of the battery uh, is going to be depleted by. And so, the, and the and the faster you go, the more wind resistance is actually exponential. Okay, it's why you know the, the U.S. government back in the '70s when we had the gas shortages made people drive 55 miles an hour because it saves a lot more and uh, fuel than you would imagine. Then it's even 10 miles more or 15 miles more uses significantly more fuel. More fuel. Um, anyway, so running pumps, running the lights, running all these things that that battery is not going to have a problem. Okay, it's it's getting you there. It's going on 10 calls is the problem. It's driving 80 is the call driving, driving, you know, 68 and a half uh, when it's cold, 68 and a half up up a hill, um, that type of thing. All right, so let's dig in a little further here. I just wanted to explain this in case I was uh, guys aren't familiar as well. So Right, so this is, you're pulling into the firehouse, right? So I don't think this aspect of things, it, I actually think it's great. The electric engine can be vastly more convenient for guys. You already have like electrical service in the firehouse. Guys are already accustomed to plugging in um, pneumatic lines or electrical lines to keep the battery charged. So plugging it in to, in some other manner is really not that big a deal. But in my view, because you're putting in a battery system that just doesn't have the the capabilities of say again like a Tesla semi or that forget 500 miles give me 200 miles give me 250 um, I mean we could probably any city could probably handle 150 but get me to a point where I'm not relying upon um, a, a diesel engine or a gas engine to supplement but that also changes the entire dynamic as far as the charging you're going to need these level three chargers, right? If I only get 37 miles and I come back to quarters, you know, I got to charge this thing immediately and get it plugged in and slam this thing. I think they said it'll do it in 90 minutes, which, okay. I mean, 90 minutes is 90 minutes. That's pretty damn fast, but not if another call comes in uh, and someone's dying. But um, again, under they've chosen this firehouse. This is not an accident. Guys that understand this business understand the technology, have placed this uh, engine in a place that it's most suited for its needs. Okay, the other thing I completely forgot to talk about, you know, we said it goes 37 miles. Uh, and so obviously if you lived in an area, uh, your, your department goes longer distances. I've mentioned this before, my department goes on the New Jersey Turnpike. You know, you could, you could bang out 25 miles in one call. You get onto the Turnpike, there's only exits a certain distance away and you're obligated to drive down to the next exit and come back and before you know you know it I, I put close to 37 miles on it on one trip right this is this would not be beneficial for 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 us uh, granted again it has the diesel engine and so you're fine maybe you'd have no difference but if we're moving towards this technology we obviously want it to work uh, but the the things I'm not haven't mentioned is Topography, right? So if you're in Colorado and going up hills and mountains, um, it's going to crush the battery rather quickly. That 37 miles is going to go into half. If it also happens to be freezing cold, right? So temperature, warm, really, really warm will affect it with the air conditioning. But by far, really, I'd, I'd take, I would much take really warm than really, really cold. Really, really cold will will crush the battery as far as its its capabilities. You'll be running heat, it's just, it's gonna hurt it. And when you have 500 miles or 300 miles or 200 miles and you lose 50%, it's not the end of the world. You still have 100 miles or 200 miles or 300 miles left. Well, you have 37 miles and it's cold and so everybody gets it. Um, so anyway, the, the moral of this story is I think it's, 
a great idea that Pierce has taken the lead here and is trying to uh, move the world in a, in a dire- in the right direction. But um, I think this ultimately will fall, fall short for most departments, and uh, they just got to do better. Okay, so that's just it. And this is coming from a person who already likes the technology, already believes in the technology. But I think for the average Joe department, got to do better. Somebody better, somebody, somebody better pick up the phone and give Elon Musk a call and start using their technology because this ain't going to do it, boys. Uh, not in the short term. All right. I think that's it. Uh, thanks for visiting uh, Transmit the 1075, and we'll see you at the next one. Master Plan Part 3. So as uh, Zach was mentioning, the, the thing that I think is we wanted to convey, probably more, more importantly than anything else that we talk about here, is that there is a clear path to a sustainable energy Earth. It's not, um, it doesn't require destroying uh, natural habitats. Uh, it doesn't uh, require us to be austere and stop using electricity and sort of be in the cold or anything. Um, the, the, the story, and I think it, this holds together quite well, and we'll be actually publishing a detailed white paper with all of our assumptions and calculations, is that there is a, there is a clear path to a fully sustainable Earth uh, with abundance. In fact, you could support a civilization much bigger than Earth, than, than much more than the, the 8 billion humans, uh, could actually be uh, supported sustainably on Earth. And I'm, I'm just often shocked and surprised by how few people realize this. Um, most of the smart people I know actually don't see a, a, this clear path. They, they think that um, there's, there's not a path to a sustainable energy future, or at least there's not one that uh, is sustainable at our current population, um, or that we'd have to resort to extreme measures. None of this is true. So we're going to walk through the, the calculations for how to create a sustainable energy civilization. Yeah. <clears throat> and to set the stage, today our energy economy, it's, let's be honest, it's dirty and it's wasteful. Over 80% of global energy, primary energy, comes from fossil fuels and only one-third of that global energy actually ends up delivering useful work or heat. This is the problem statement, but we're here to talk about the solution. Yeah, it's, it's like, if for <clears throat> some of this I'm going to elaborate because there's, there's, there's a very wide range of technical expertise uh, out there from people who are like, you know, whatever, level nine wizards in the subject to people who do not do engineering at all. So uh, like when, if you have a gasoline car, you're, uh, you're, you're converting less than a third, uh, often maybe only 25% of the energy in the gasoline is converted into motion. The rest is turned into waste heat. That does no, doesn't do any good at all. And there's a lot of energy required even to get the oil out of the ground, to refine the oil, uh, and to transport the gasoline to the gas station. So when you, when you look at all that for a typical gasoline car is, is actually going to be using less than 20% fully considered of the uh, energy from the oil actually goes into motion. So this is a, when, when, I see people, or when we see people doing calculations for what does it take to create a sustainable energy earth, they assume that the same energy amount is required for an, elect, for an, electri- an electrified civilization versus a combustion civilization. This is not true, the, because uh, most of the energy of combustion is waste heat. And even to get the fuel to combust in the first place and get it to the end use, there's a lot lost along the way. I mean, this is the primary energy consumption, 165 petawatt hours a year. Petawatt hour is a trillion uh, trillion kilowatt hours, so it's a large amount of energy. But the nice thing about an electrified economy, uh, there's a better way, we're going to talk about it, is that through end use efficiency and through efficiency along every step of the way, actually the total energy use halves. So this is one of the most enabling aspects of electrifying everything, uh, is that the sustainable energy economy is that much 
easier to accomplish. It's actually half the problem statement of the fossil fuel economy. Yeah, and we're being conservative here, so it could be better than half, but uh, we're, we're trying to have assumptions that are reasonable, not overly optimistic, in fact, slightly pessimistic. Uh, so it's really better than half, but just say for, it's, it's, it's easy to make the argument that we need half as much energy with an electric economy versus a, a combustion economy. Yep. Um, so how the master plan works? You want to talk uh, about yeah. um, So the, 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 the thing that is needed in, at very large scale that is not currently present is a vast amount of battery energy storage. Uh, our rough calculations are that this is about 240 terawatt hours or 240,000 gigawatt hours. Um, this is a lot of batteries, but it is actually a very achievable amount. Uh, we'll go into details on that. Yep. So th uh, that's a combination of electric vehicles and stationary storage. So if you've got solar or wind, you've got to store the energy when the wind is not blowing, the sun is not shining. Um, and so we're assuming sort of an eight to one ratio of uh, stored energy to power. So 30 terawatt hours of power, uh, 30 terawatts of power. Um, our actual uh, capital expenditure calculation for manufacturing investment is more like uh, six trillion, but we, you know, we made it higher to make it 10 trillion. And this um, is across mining, refining, you know, battery factories, recycling, vehicle factories, all the things that we're going to talk about needing to invest in to build this sustainable energy economy. Yeah. Now, if you look at the total world economy, it's just under 100 trillion. So if this was spread out, say, over 10 years, it would be 1% of the global economy. Over 20 years, uh, it would be half a percent Very of doable. the global economy. So this is, uh, yeah, n not a big number relative to the global economy. Um, as Drew mentioned, you need about half as much energy with an electric economy versus a combustion economy. And in terms of wind and solar, how much land would be used? It's less than 0.2% of the land area of Earth. Um, like generally, people don't realize quite how much energy is reaching us from the sun. Um, it's roughly a gigawatt per square kilometer. Um, and you know, the sun doesn't shine all the time, but it's, uh, if you multiply that by, say, uh, four to get the continuous power, four or five, uh, then that, that, that gives you the land area of solar. And you can put wind and solar often in the same place. So a lot of places that currently have wind, you could have solar there and you double your energy. You can also put wind offshore. It doesn't even need yeah. to be on land. So wind is even more flexible. You could put solar offshore too. Yep. So Earth is 70% water. <laughs> um, anyway, the point is that um, with, a, with a pretty, really a remarkably small amount of of Earth's land area, we can go fully sustainable. Um, yeah. And, so. and, and from a, do the resources and raw materials exist to support this transition? Uh, we'll go through that in detail, but we do not see any insurmountable resource challenges at all. In fact, in the end, we should be um, mining less ore to accomplish this economy than we currently do with the fossil fuel economy, and we're gonna talk through that. Yeah, just to emphasize that again, the electrified economy will require less mining than the current economy does. Yes. Less, not more. Okay. Um, so this is the plan, and now we'll get into a little more of the details of the plan. Basically, five areas of work. Um, first, renewable power, the existing grid. Second, switch to, the, to electric vehicles. Third, switch homes, businesses, and industry heating to heat pumps. Uh, fourth, high temp heat delivery uh, and storage for high temp uh, industrial and chemical processes and uh, a little bit of green hydrogen in there for chemical processes that need hydrogen. Um, and finally, sustainable, sustainably fuel planes and boats. These are the five areas and we're gonna go into detail on in all of them. Yeah, I mean, my personal opinion is that as we improve the energy density of batteries, you'll see all transportation uh, go fully electric um, with the exception of rockets. That's awkward. Um, but, uh, but you can make the, for the fuel with uh, CO2 and water. So you can make methane with CO2 and water. So, and in you fact, can do that with just electricity. So. Yes, exactly. So, uh, so, in fact, on Mars, if we hopefully get there at some point, um, 
the atmosphere is CO2 and there's water ice uh, throughout Mars, so you can take the uh, CO2 and H2O and turn that into CH4, which is methane and oxygen. So ultimately, even rockets uh, can be electrified. So first, uh, repowering the existing grid with renewables. And this is going to be a consistent theme. You'll see our estimates for the number of terawatt hours, terawatts, and trillions of investment at the bottom of the page. You know, this is already actively occurring in front of us. 60% of the generation added to the US grid was solar in 2022. And actually, on a year-on-year -year basis, solar deployment is growing 50% year-on-year uh, as of 2022. So this is a, this is a serious uh, 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 upswing. And if we continue this trend, this is going to be behind us before we even know it. Yeah. Um, second, <clears throat> switching to electric vehicles. Again, 21% uh, reduction in fossil fuel use by doing this alone. Obviously, Tesla is heavily engaged in this activity, as along with many others. Um, overall, EV production grew 59% year on year in 2022, and EVs hit an amazing 10% market share. I mean, it's an awesome milestone. I, I've, I'm super excited to see that. I, I got to. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> th this is uh, obviously happening very rapidly, um, and I mean, I think re really all cars will go to uh, fully electric. Um, and autonomous. Um, and so r riding a non-autonomous uh, gasoline car is going to be analogous to riding a horse and using a flip phone. Uh, that's basically going to be the situation. And we actually uh, took a somewhat conservative assumption here in terms of how many batteries are required, because the more the fleet is autonomous, the, the, the fewer, the, the smaller the fleet needs to be, just from a utility basis. So we're not accounting for all of those benefits, or really much of those benefits at all in this number. Um, and what does this fleet look like? You know, just rough view from our perspective. Of course, we could be wrong, but you know, uh, you can see the sort of breakdown of the fleet by millions of vehicles. Um, you know, our goal is to do 20 million electric vehicles a year. Yeah, you, fewer vehicles will be needed, at least passenger vehicles, uh, with autonomy. So um, there's some debate as to what that number is, but it's it's some number less than the number of vehicles needed today. There's roughly 2 billion cars and trucks uh, in operation in the world today. And yeah, so what we show here is actually, I think, only 1.4 million or, or so. So we're, yeah. we're, we're represent 1.4 billion, I mean, or so, so a smaller fleet. And you know, the, the numbers are at, here in this presentation are around 85 million vehicles a year produced, just to give you a sense of how we're thinking about this. Again, we're going to put all these assumptions up online and you know, encourage people's thoughts. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're basically heading rapidly towards an electric or autonomous future.